Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chet, episode 525, featuring an interview with Mr. Kurt Collada. Uh, now, Kurt's a name, you, you've probably seen that if you've been around for a while. He uh, founded the Hardcore Gaming one-on-one uh, -on -one site, which is the go-to for <laughs> many, many different kinds of games and series. Uh, he's also a prolific author, uh, most recently, and the uh, main reason I want to have him on I was to talk about his new book, uh, The Guide to Japanese Role-Playing Games. It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> the, the PDF, the hardcover is on its way, but man, uh, this is going to be a must-have resource if you're, you don't want to uh, learn more about uh, JRPGs. He's done a lot more stuff than that. He's got books on graphic adventure games, a lot of console stuff, a lot of... Uh, He's working on a book about movie games, Metroidvania. He's just kind of a walking encyclopedia of games. Uh, anyway, I was really happy to have him on. I wanted to chat with him and meet him for, for a long time now. Uh, so without further ado, here is Kurt Collada. Yeah, this is. I'm really excited about this book, Kurt. <laughs> cool, cool. So yeah, I thought it, for some reason I was thinking it was just a hardcover book. But uh, yeah, apparently when I bought the hardcover, I guess that'll take a while to get to me. Oh, yeah, it takes like, I mean, they come from the UK, so it takes about maybe a week or so. Oh, this is looking fantastic. I don't, can I show a little bit of this book? Is that okay? Oh, sure. I have a copy of my, I have to go run downstairs to get it. Oh, well, I got it up here. We could uh, just make sure I'm not violating some kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, copyright code. Yeah, this is, uh, this bitmap books, they do beautiful, uh, beautiful books. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, you're no stranger to the book publishing world. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is... So you... Have you been hearing uh, some feedback, some reviews, anything like that? People. Uh, seem... Yeah, people seem to really like it, which is good. I don't know. Have you ever seen my Dun Dungeons and Desktops book? Yes. Um, I'd known about it a long time ago when I started working on the uh, the adventure game book. Oh, yeah. Because at the time, there weren't really many like genre histories. Uh, so that was one of the only ones that I really knew about. And I have a copy of it because we were in a uh, story bundle together an, uh, a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I know I've got a copy of your uh, Adventure Games book. Yeah. Must be in one of those bundles. I was looking. I thought I had a hardcover. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I see you've got the same. Uh... <laughs> yeah, this is what everybody wants to know, right? How can you define this yeah. thing? <laughs> I think I, I think it did a pretty good job do. in as much as like however many pages this ended up being. Are you hearing from people? I always hear from people that are like, well, you didn't cover this game or you left off my favorite game. <laughs> yeah. Uh we got a lot of them, but like it is it's a big book. It's like six hundred and fifty pages or so. Uh and we oh. covered all the major ones, like Wow, 655 pages. Yeah, it is a lot of stuff. And I mean, there's there's some like borderliner games that ended up just having to get cut out because um, got the, like, is it really an RPG? Well, kind of, but we ran out of room. So uh, they had to get um, cut. Yeah, I hear about that all the time. Yeah, that actually happened with one of uh, Bitmap's books. They did a, um, about the art of adventure games. Yeah, and they left out Quest for Glory because um, <laughs> they were like, "Well, Quest for Glory is actually an RPG, so this isn't this doesn't really count." And of course, everybody else is like, "No, like it's a Sierra game. We think of it as an adventure game." So when they when they did a second printing, they added Quest for Glory in. Yeah, there's a lot of games like that that are just kind of hard to pin down into one category or genre. Yeah, yeah. Do you would. Uh... Did you put Legend of Zelda as a role playing game? Or? Yes, I was happy in, <laughs> it was in there because the debated ones, right? Yeah, it's it's a very early one, but like I have a bunch of Japanese um, guidebooks from the time, and they're like, "Yeah, Zelda's an RPG. Why not?" Um, I'd rather just put it in there than not. I mean, but not. like the case for that I try to make for it is that it was an RPG at the time, but people's definition of what an RPG meant shifted over, like. And Zelda didn't really like advance and go with it, so um, they tend to not think of it. But I think, like especially the recent ones, um, you know, like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, like they are absolutely, yeah, yeah definitely closer to the old days. And yeah. I mean, Zelda too even has like experience points and stuff like that. I think yeah, it's just to think clearly an RPG. Zelda too is really closer. Yeah, let me show the uh, store page for this. 
I don't know if there's other places they can buy it. You could tell me, but this seemed this is where I got it from. You can get it off of Amazon, but they're they're um it ends up being more expensive. I don't know why. Got a little red little red bookmark there, a little uh ribbon. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do a good job from printing this. Oh wow, I can't wait to get I want this tomorrow. <laughs> it's sleep. Oh, it yeah, they did a great shot with this. So this is all oh wow. Yeah, I know some people here are gonna be buying this. Mm. Oh, you got action RPGs. Yeah, it's it's it broke it down into like, uh, like the main three or four, um, they call it series, and then kind of gets broken down into like oh, this is like a standard what people think of when they think of a Japanese RPG, and then you get down to action RPGs and monster collecting and strategy RPGs, all the different subgenres, and a little bit to uh. The dungeon crawlers like the wizardry likes and the the rogue likes was oh, this pirates of the caribbean down there oh that's kingdom hearts kingdom hearts is like oh yeah it's a it's a huge crossover game so it has like, Donald. yeah <laughs> just, that one always just kind of blew my mind yeah that's that's a weird <laughs> the what's weird the weirdest game. one is do you have a the weirdest rpg chapter <laughs> uh they're they're sort of scattered in there um, there's one that was kind of a mess called Maka Maka. If you can find it's a super Famicom game. Uh, what's it called? Maka Maka. I don't know even how to spell that. <laughs> yeah, M A K A M A K A. M A K A. Yeah, it's just a. Yeah, they got weird. It'll take some time to search because it's such a big book. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Maka Maka. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Was this guy wearing a box? Yeah, it's a strange game. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess you must know Japanese, huh? Uh enough to get by. Um like, um just having translation tools helps a lot. Like you can't rely on them one hundred percent, but even just for looking up like words is so much easier just to type it in instead of trying to look up words in a dictionary. It's a mess. The quintessential 16-bit uh, what is that word? Kusoge? Kusoge. Kusoge. So that's a, uh, a slang term for crap game. That's what it means literally. So it's like famously garbage. Um, just because it was a mess. Like There was no real quality control in this game and it was released with terrible, terrible bugs. Like I know people complain about games being patched nowadays, but especially RPGs in this era, like they were held together with duct tape, more or less. <laughs> Say, I just noticed this little piece over here is filled with so many bugs from start to finish <laughs> that even its closing credits can't be displayed properly. Wow. Yeah. That's that's bugs. Wow. Well, I bet you're rightly proud of that book. <laughs> yeah. What are your, uh, you'd be the person, the best person to ask about this. You know, I was thinking when I was uh, doing my Dungeons and Desktops book, I have a little bit about JRPGs in there. You got like a chapter or two, but I quickly realized, you know, if I really wanted to do justice to this, it would be at least a book yeah, <laughs> on its own. <laughs> uh, huge. Uh, so what do you think are the main uh, differences between the uh, these JRPGs and CRPGs? And the influence, obviously, it's not just a one-way influence. They've influenced each other. Yeah. Quite a um, bit. The way I started back in the 80s, there really wasn't a difference. Because, yeah. you know, when computers first started coming out, the Japanese fans were importing American computers, mostly like Apple IIs and things like that, and playing games. And then when they started coming out with, uh, you know, their own local computers, they started making their own takes on stuff like Ultima and Wizardry and what have you until they got like official ports, which showed up eventually. Um, I, the, there's a bunch of games, like the three main pillars of the Japanese RPG are called Muga no Shinzo, Hyde Lied, and Dragon Slayer. Muga no Shinzo is basically Ultima, but they took the first person turn-based combat of Wizardry. And... That is very similar to what Dragon Quest ended up being. 
And the main things that set Dragon Quest on, because Dragon Quest is the game that's sort of like when you think of a JRPG, that's the primordial one. Like it's not the first RPG made in Japan, but it begins uh, to coalesce all the elements that you think of one. Um, one of the bigs is usability. Since it was made for a Famicom, which only has like two buttons, four buttons, if you can count, start and select, it's very easy to play. It's intended for children. It's intended for like regular people. Um, like RPGs were almost always famously inscrutable to the point where a lot of them like needed like beyond an instruction manual, like a whole strategy guide to figure out. Um, with Dragon Quest, like they obviously sell strategy guides to help us play it. Um, but it's relatively easy to understand. Uh, the balance is relatively easy to understand. Like it's always a, um, you're always walking forward and getting stronger. Accessible. Yeah, accessible. And that's uh, the key for that one. And the other thing is just art design. Uh, Dragon Quest, the, the artwork and all the enemies and characters were designed by Akira Toriyama, who even at the time was one of the most popular manga authors in Japan. Like at the time, Dragon Ball was, you know, that on its own is just tremendously influential when it comes to manga and anime. But he was the guy. It's not even like the peak of his career, arguably. But he's his cover. His art is on the cover of that. You, you're beating up all the enemies. You're playing as his characters. And that's usually what you think of, like when you think of a Japanese manga style, something mm. like that. And Dragon Quest wasn't like incredibly popular right out the gate, but it did eventually, um, you know, just word of mouth and what have you. And to the point where like Dragon Quest three came out in, I want to say 1987, that's when the fever pitch came in. They're like, okay, this is selling tremendously. Uh, <laughs> and so not only was that incredibly uh, successful for Enix and the developers of Dragon Quest, but that's also when the, the clones started coming out and other similar type of games. Um, Final Fantasy also came out around the same time, but like that had been development before Dragon Quest three came out. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily a clone of it. They were just working off the same ideas. That's 110 pages where you get to this. <laughs> that is yeah. not the same before. Wow. Oh yeah. That's all. That's all the, the early stuff. I think Falcom, the Falcom chapter might've precluded this because Falcom was one of the companies that was really like in the ditches of early RPGs. Um, one of the games I mentioned before, as far as part as being the pillars, was a game called Dragon Slayer. And Dragon Slayer, I don't, I think it was just kind of like a moderate success. But mm -hmm. um, the game that came after that was called Xanadu. And that was like for a long time one of the best selling PC games in Japan. Because uh, mostly because it was so inscrutable. Because back then, like creating a game, it's almost like a big puzzle. Because uh, you would go in a dungeon. And you'd have to fight monsters, but it's very resource limited. So you would need to manage, um, you know, like your healing potions in your life, because if you screwed up, then you would just get stuck and have to start over, reload a save game or something like that. Um, and again, that was really, really popular. But yeah, that Falcom was huge into that. Um, some of their games actually did come out in America. Xanadu was... Um, there was a controversy with um, Richard Garriott. Oh, when... that's the one. With... Yeah, I, I saw that. There's that other um, that Ultima book um, where there was a story that he visited their offices with the intention on maybe uh, licensing some of their games for America. And then he he saw that the in-game graphics, like they were traced over the manual art from one of the Ultima games. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the story goes that he stormed out of the room um, I don't, I, I don't know how true that is. Like, I don't know why you would scupper a business deal over something which is like that. But, you know, who knows? I remember reading something like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Adam's book maybe. Or... Um, somewhat like Sorcerian. Sorcerian came out in America from Sierra because there was a brief period of time that they were licensing Japanese games. Um, they put out Silphied. They Thexter. put out two Fexter titles. Fexter is great. Yeah, Zelliard was another one that they did. And there's another company that I don't know if they were owned by Broderbund or they were somehow associated with Broderbund that they put out a couple of uh, games too. Um, there's one game in there, I think it was under Cosmic Soldier or Psychic War. Uh, that came out in the US. 
Uh, there was one that I wish I didn't know it was an RPG until like relatively recently called Wybarm. And it is like very much a combination of Thexter and Xanadu. Huh. And I hadn't played it when I wrote the RPG book, but whenever we do a follow up, it's definitely going to have to go in That's there. Cool. So you could sort of transform like a Thexter game. Oh, yeah, it's exactly like that. Um, it's not quite as difficult as Xanadu, but it is like you know, you're in this big area that you can you fly around as uh fly around or change into like a human robot and zap enemies. Uh, but whenever you collide with an enemy, it goes to a separate screen and you need to beat up enemies there. That's a very uh, Japanese RPG thing. Um, it is very level dependent. Like you have to beat enemies in a specific order to get stronger. Otherwise you're just not going to get anywhere. Squashed. Yeah. I think so. That was the first category. Yeah. I think you said there were like three, right? <laughs> oh, the third, the third game is uh highlight. Oh, highlight. Okay. And highlight was like a big action RPG. Um, and you can trace stuff like Zelda and East is the other series by Falcom that is more internationally known because um, it ended up on getting ported basically everywhere. Uh, but yeah, that's highlight. <laughs> that did come out for the Nintendo. And I remember having a really bad reputation when it was a kid, like it got terrible reviews, but that's because it came out like several years after it originally did. It was the game that, you know, arguably inspired the original Legend of Zelda, but the Legend of Zelda is so much better in like every way. So that highlights it just seemed really super basic. Um, but I think now that people are more, more aware of the context around it, like, OK, I, I get why people like highlight now, stuff like that. I've always been intrigued by the way wizardry moved over there and, and of course, started started over here, I guess, with Surtek. I've had some of those guys on. Yeah, that they the really and like, even some of those were surprised. Like, wow, this series is still ongoing and it's real popular. Oh, yeah. Recently, there's a an OVA that I watched of it that was like, um, and I mean, there's a they have their own role playing stuff that came from Dungeons and Dragons. Like there's a like one of the really famous works of Japanese fantasy is Record of Lotus War, which was basically just like some guys did a role playing campaign of what well, was probably Dungeons and Dragons, but I don't necessarily know if they said it was Dungeons and Dragons for licensing reasons, but they might not have cared back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that's it's it's sort of how it becomes. It's basically an off brand Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I always wondered how popular the Dungeons and Dragons game was over there in the early eighties. I think I'm not super knowledgeable about it. I know this is how they started. Yeah, they even mentioned it's a Dungeons and Dragons. And I know these guys, they sort of made their own oh, yeah. role playing system. So they were able to sell it and they were in, involved in some other games after this. And of course, they were um, RPG conversions of this. Like Sword World RPG that they mentioned on there. That was, I want to say what, what they created. Yeah, but it's it's fun. You can even see the influence of that now. Like this is one uh, Netflix anime called Delicious in Dungeon. And it is, it is very much in that same line of uh, like a bunch of standard uh, like role playing classes go on an adventure in a dungeon. It's really cool. It'll never get sold. <laughs> yeah, the anime style is really, really striking in those. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, getting back to the original question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what separates them? As, as games became more advanced, then they started really having strong storylines. And there wasn't so much of that in the early days just because of like disk space and ROM space. Uh, so that most of the manual, most of the storyline was in the manual. But especially um, kind of like when we're on the early 90s um, with 16 bit consoles where they were got really like story focused, really character writing. And it was still a little simple, but mm -hmm. um, they really began focusing more on storytelling. And that was kind of the track that they took that diverged it away from what we would consider uh, a role playing game. And this is just in broad strokes. Like there, there are still plenty of Japanese games that maintain um, like they're, they're open ended or they're not as story focused, but they aren't really as widely known in the West because, well, games like Final Fantasy is what helped popularize them. So games like Final Fantasy were the games that were localized. Yeah. Um, 
So the the lesser or more mechanically obtuse games, they generally got passed over. Um, but they've been localizing some more of them recently. Um, like the, the saga games, they very they're they're really made for people who like the sort of RPG systems uh, found in these type of games and want to break them. Um, so they're quite a bit different than something like Final Fantasy, even though superficially they look like them. I always thought that would be one of the great challenges of uh, of, of the, the localizing, I guess, would be one of the big challenges with a lot of these games, right? Because you're trying to familiarize people with... <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's, it's probably much different now because we've had anime for all these years and people... Yeah, there's a lot, a lot more cultural knowledge. It's, I mean, there's a chapter on the book in that, too. There's also technical issues yeah. that came with... Um, especially limited ROM space because these games like they, they tended to be made for a Japanese audience and they were programmed with the intention that they would never be released in any other language, but Japanese. Uh, <laughs> so when they would come to localize it, they would run into problems because <laughs> um, like from a technical perspective, if you're using, there's, there's three different alphabets in Japanese and the biggest one is kanji, which is based off of Chinese and there are, a few thousand of them that are used in everyday use. So when you store them, you're using a double byte character. Um, whereas in English, you can use a single byte character. You can fit any alphabetical thing in like 256 bits, uh, bytes, sorry. A few um, <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is like, unless somebody would go back and change the, the text rendering from a double byte to a single byte, then you would have the English text take up so much more space because even though there's all these, um, you know, thousands of symbols, you can, Japanese is very compact. Like you can fit a lot into that space. Oh, okay. Um, so that was something like uh, fan translators and ROM hackers, they, they effectively have to reverse engineer these games because, you know, the source code from this is completely inaccessible. So they have to contend with that to get it to fit. What, what percentage would you say have been translated and localized? Uh, fan are, like vast... There's still a lot of them. I mean, I think at this point, a lot of the major like eight and sixteen bit games have probably been localized. But um, when I say that, I mean like Famicom and Super Famicom. The PC Engine is sort of still like an unexplored frontier. Um, there's some games that have been translated, but not not as many as the other platforms. Like you can like there's a lot of random obscure Super Famicom RPGs you can find an English translation for it but even for relatively popular PC Engine games like um, one of their big ones is called Tengai Makyo uh, Far East of Eden and it was only very recently that that uh, got a fan translation so slowly I think they'll work their way through that series which I hope they do because it's a really good series yeah I like there's all sorts of hidden gems <laughs> waiting yeah. Let's, let's, uh, unless you've got more to say about this, I want to get into sort of your history. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so if I have this right, you started you started writing about games at the age of fifteen. Probably a little earlier, technically, but as far as any way that anybody would read them, yeah, it's probably when I discovered the internet. Geo Cities, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> um. So you must have been like one of the first people. Yeah, I was, you know, I was in high school. I mean, there were there were sites around, but not many. No, I don't. Yeah, not not, not at that time. Um, like I went through the series where I was, you know, into console games. And when I got my computer, then I was into computer games. I was like, oh, console games are for babies. Um, and then I discovered emulators because they were those were first beginning to mm -hmm. take off. And of course, like all, they were still in an early state. But because you could download a ROM for basically anything, like all those games that I had wanted to play, but just never bought or rented or borrowed, like you could finally play. And that, um, that's what reminded me of Castlevania, which is a series I'd, I'd liked. Like, you know what? I want to make a fan site. Um, before then, I'd want to make, before the internet, I really liked adventure games and I wanted to make a fan site for Space Quest. No, uh, Space Quest. Yeah, Space Quest is a series that I think lends itself well to that sort of stuff, because there was like five games at that point. There's a lot of cross referencing between them in a way that made it seem like a persistent universe, 
like CR games were good about things like that. But at that time, I was into console games. So it was between Castlevania, Contra, or Ninja Gaiden. And I was like, ah, Castlevania is pretty cool. What was the, the computer that you had? Oh, it's an old compact. Uh, 48633. Okay. It was 212 <laughs> megs of hard drive space and four gig, four, no, gigs, four megs of RAM. I just had the Space Quest historian on. Oh, yeah. He's oh. actually, he's the one who created uh, at least one of the first Space Quest fan pages, right? Must have. Yeah. If he was doing it as early as you. You were this. <laughs> I'm trying to think back to 90, 1997. I don't even know. Was even a. Was that still, we were still using the uh, Netscape Navigator? <laughs> oh, probably. I mean, I was, we were going through America Online. Before that, I had Prodigy because we had a really slow modem and that was Prodigy, the only thing yeah, I remember yeah, that. it worked. But I remember finding like, um, yeah, like fan clubs. I was part of like a Monkey Island fan club um, because at that point, Monkey Island 2 was the last one and that ended at such a weird ending that everybody like wanted to make their own Monkey Island 3. So we even got together and <laughs> made, it was probably a pretty terrible script because we were teenagers at best. Um, but that's what the vibe was like back then. So you were interested in a lot of other things, I guess. But Oh, yeah. Sylvania Dungeon. I found, I don't know. Yeah, I had it up here. Yeah, here we go. So this probably, is this what it looked like back then? There's No, but somewhere. Oh, you're, yeah, 2021. So this is still being. Yeah, but as you can yeah. see, it hadn't been updated in like a decade. Yeah, we should. Uh, I should have pulled up the. Uh, what's that website you can go to and find old copies? archive? Yeah, archive. I, have, I actually have somewhere. I don't remember the URL, but the, the, you can have a previous version of this that used frames, and oh frames, because <laughs> that was like originally it was like pretty much just all black when it was originally a GeoCities page, and it was very simple, and it was like that way for like a year or two. And then there was a guy who knew about more web design than me. And he's like, let me redesign the site for you. And he did. And that was what it used up until probably 2006. Because uh, at that point, I was beginning to do like kind of amateur journalism uh, for this one website. And I was able to get tickets to E3 back then. And I, I was trying to get into Konami's good graces. Because at the time, like, you know, nowadays companies really buddy up to streamers like anybody can get review copies um but back then their attitude is like we don't talk to fan sites we don't care yeah. um but since i actually had an in with the pr people like i was like okay we're gonna make this site look relatively professional and that was the last time there was any major redesign so that was probably around 2006 2007 and that's how it's been ever since i know you had said somewhere that you Kind of miss some of these, some of the old days. Yeah, the, I know. mean, you know, you make a point. I had the same experience because when I did that Dungeons and Desktops book, you know, I had to. It was incredibly tough to find anything about most of those games. I mean, there just yeah. was there was you couldn't just go to Wikipedia <laughs> and find a, an entry on the game and like extensive commentary. So yeah, I missed that too. Yeah, the uh, I mean, in some ways, wikis are, I guess, I don't know, the crowdsource because, like, when you're it's a fan site, it's, it falls all on one person, and one person they get they get burnt out, they get distracted with life and things like that. So, at least with that, it's it's crowdsourced, but at the same time, you sort of miss some of that personality, and it, it kind of doesn't help that the like the wikis are owned by some like awful corporation. Um, oh, sure. They're 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 like almost impossible to navigate, um, just cluttered with ads and, and junk like that. And it's annoying because like it's it's all like I don't know of how much they actually employ people to do that. But I feel like a lot of it is probably volunteers and then they're making money off of free labor, more or less. Ugh. Yeah. Did you ever have any forum drama? on the Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't really remember yeah, exactly. a lot of it. I it think it's like a new ago. thing, these flame wars and stuff. But I remember a lot of these discussion boards. Yeah. You just the amount of vitriol, <laughs> the passion <laughs> that can get worked up over. Just... Yeah. 
Crazy stuff. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about Castlevania since that seems like that was your. Would you say that was your first uh, sort of big splash and yep first of a <laughs> burst onto the scene? Now, you know, looking back, what do you uh, see as the Castlevania's influence on video games? Just well, is this this sort of divided into two eras because you have the, the classic ones, which is what are all in the Nintendo and Super Nintendo and Genesis, where they were like pretty straightforward side scrollers, but they were like top of their class as far as graphics and design and especially music music yeah um and then castlevania symphony of the night came out and that was i think the what would end up be the biggest legacy of the series and it wasn't technically all that original because there was castlevania 2 which was a sort of open-ended action rpg um like zelda 2 and other similar games of the time and it was very much like cribbing off of super metroid um but the thing is that Nintendo really fumbled Metroid for quite a long time because like I was always in the impression that everybody loved Super Metroid. Like it got tremendous reviews. Oh, they didn't. Um, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, everybody. I, I mean, like the only person I do was like my one friend in eighth grade who had a Super Nintendo and him like he rented Super Metroid, beat it. And then the next day got his mom to buy it for him. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> when you're that age um buying having your mom buy like a $70 game you already beat and that was like something really good it must have been something special yeah but they just didn't follow up on it like i don't like i know they were there making some sort of 3D one and just never went anywhere so symphony of the night sort of carried that torch for that style of game that was just very uncommon for whatever reason i guess um it didn't quite take off in japan because, I mean, this is still, like, early on. So several years later, Nintendo eventually did revisit Metroid um, with the Game Boy Advance and the GameCube game. And the GameCube game was fantastic, even though it was a first-person game. Um, and they continued with Metroid Fusion and Zero Mission, but that was also a little limited, whereas Konami was like, okay, everybody loves Symphony of the Night. We're going to keep at this. And they made... Between the Game Boy Advance and DS, like six games of those series. So they, they really kept that style alive. And that's one of the reasons why when you think of these types of games, they're Metroidvanias. Because um, people were looking for a, a word to, to determine these type of games. And that's where that sort of sprung out from. And of course, it ended up becoming a name of a whole subgenre that's really proliferated of the indie scene. And people argue about that all the time, too. I think I think they kind of overthink it a little bit. Um, really, are, what, what are they arguing about? About whether it's an appropriate name for the genre. <laughs> I, I think it's in the same way that, like, yeah. you know, you think of rogue like. Well, it's like, well, that doesn't say anything if you don't know anything about rogue. But at the same time, like, people who play video games know. Yeah, I always saw that sort of thing as kind of paying homage to the sort of. The game that started it all or popularized it you know yeah yeah i want to kind of credit the makers of rogue yeah you know, I, was, I was playing around with diablo like <laughs> uh, yeah I see what they're saying now that i think about it but yeah because so, when you think of like i don't know people how would you, how would you describe it i mean you have to come up with this big jumble of words to try to describe exactly what you're talking about because i heard sure people refer to diablo as like an action rpg which it is but when I think of action RPG, I think of more console games mm. um, like East or like Zelda or Terra Enigma or any of that sort of stuff. And then people also call it a dungeon crawler. Well, there's already a dungeon crawler genre. So I think about a game where you really need good controls and it's re a lot of reflex, you know. It's, yeah. I used to call them Twitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Games. You know, Diablo, I guess, you know, you're, you're clicking a mouse a lot. <laughs> but it feels a lot different to me than, you know. Yeah, very much its own thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, you were doing okay with the Castlevania Dungeon, but at some point you launched into Hardcore Gaming 101. So, what, so, so that, like, even when I was making the Castlevania Dungeon, like, there's a limit about what you can do with a fan site, because eventually you write about all the games and you're just kind of sitting around waiting for the next one to come out. Yeah. Um, so... I was again getting into like revisiting all these old games and I started something called the classic gaming review archive. 
that was sort of stuck on classic gaming, which were just reviews, more or less, of different, mostly Nintendo and some Genesis games. And then after I graduated from college, I wanted to go back and again, visit, revisit Castlevania. But again, there's only so much you can do with it. Uh, so I sort of took that review archive and formulated it into what became Hardcore Gaming 101. And the idea behind that was that each article series would be sort of like a mini fan site. Because one of the the, the first topics I covered was Alex Kidd. And I don't think there were any Alex Kidd fan sites at the time. Um, Alex Kidd is probably not a large or detailed enough series that you could make much of a fan site about. But it's a series I still thought was really interesting as a game that I loved when I was like six years old. Um, so the idea is that you wouldn't, um, you would just review everything together. And that way it would, it would uh, contextualize every entry in the series. The, re the reviews wouldn't necessarily need to be very long because you can establish everything about what it means at the beginning. And then each individual entry would just sort of build off of it. Like, okay, this is what was different, which is this is up to the same. This is what uh, evolved. And there were other series that ended up like that too. Um, I like finding a lot of hidden links that people didn't really know about at the time. Um, one of the first shoot 'em ups I played for the Sega Master System was a game called Power Strike, um, which I liked even though I wasn't very good at it. Oh. And then several years later, um, I played this game called Xanak for the Nintendo, which technically predated it. I'm like, this is the same game, basically. Um, another game called Musha for the Genesis. Again, same game, but they had completely different names. They came out by different publishers. But unless you looked into it, you won't necessarily know that they were all made by the same developer hmm. um, called Compile. And there's, I mean, you can see that series there. There's probably a dozen games that are all relatively similar, but because they came out by different publishers, they would have different names, even though they were like all part of the same series. Uh, so I would try to find connections and things like that. And even outside of just like games, similar staff worked on, which was a little difficult to weed through because of the very erratic way that uh, Japanese games were credited back then, if they were even credited at all. I understand there's a very different way they handle uh, developers and credits and like a very yeah. different culture when it comes to like this is my name on the game you know there's almost kind of a like well I, I don't want to emphasize my role too much you know i want to make sure everybody gets credit as i don't know you <laughs> i want to hear your take on this because just... a lot of it was just corporate stuff like they didn't want people to <laughs> i i know the fear of that that they didn't want to get headhunted by other companies because like so much of it was so new at the time that if you had experience in something and you knew how to program you know, the assembly code for this stuff, then you could be, you know, picked up by another company. And there were really big rivalries and things like that. So that was a big one. But there's also subcontracted work, too, um, that they wouldn't necessarily, just in their contract, they're like, okay, we said we made this game even though we really didn't. Like, there was a whole lot of licensed games that came out from LJN uh, back in the late 80s. A lot of them were based off of movies and stuff. And a lot of them were, were junk. Uh, some of them were not too bad. They're just a little bit more ambitious, but because they had such like short deadlines. But anyway, like if you didn't know, they were all from LJN Toys. Well, they were actually outsourced to various Japanese companies who in some case outsourced them to other Japanese companies. And they just worked as shadow developers. That sounds... I'm just trying to imagine how would you even sort all that out <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's there's a really good website called uh well moby games first of all is indispensable and just trying to track this all down um but uh, the game developers game developers resource institute gdri is also really good about um trying to pinpoint some of these subcontractors um a lot of those would, would spring about because you know people would work at a company and they would get experience and then their games would be successful and they wouldn't be paid commensurate to what they think they deserved. So they would start up their own company. Um, and but then since they had contacts, then um, they could get jobs for things like that. So that stuff like that tended to happen a lot. Were you influenced by any particular magazines or were there other websites doing 
magazines. My favorite magazine was video games and computer entertainment. Okay. Um, cause they tended to have the best reviews. Like even when I was young, I got the impression that stuff like game pro and electronic gaming monthly were aimed more towards kids. And they were fun to read. Like I still read them, but video games, computer entertainment was like the one that I subscribed to because they were like, just had the best written reviews. And it also like they were video game focused, but they also focused on computer games, which I didn't have a computer, but they were, it was fun to read about them. And it's especially good to go back and revisit them. Now. Uh, a lot of, a lot of things I look up like, Hey, I remember seeing this game 20 years ago. Let me um, look it back up. And, and see what I vaguely remember. Um, just love the artwork on these covers. <laughs> yeah. They all did, um, you know, they all commissioned uh, cover artwork, which is what I tried to do with my books, too. Um, like, you, you do get a little bit of, like, dicey legal issues, because you are technically using characters from other games. Um, but it is basically what magazines did. Yeah, I guess you yeah, see, yeah, I've never been clear on like what what is considered okay, what's fair use, what's yeah. I mean, like the interiors are fine. Yeah, I heard the Nintendo is the one that'll come after you if you try to use their their characters. Uh, but I see their characters on all kinds of books. So yeah, I mean, like they, they don't really want to go after them because it just makes them look bad, sure. and there's no real like advantage to it. So unless you're doing something especially egregious or just like you pissed off the wrong person or something like that. Like I, I, I know not to approach uh, some of these companies cause they, they might start snooping around and might start saying no. Yeah. Don't ask if you don't want to <laughs> What's yeah. it? better not to ask or something and apologize. Than yeah. To... Ask for, for beg for forgiveness later. Yeah. That's a lot of that gone around. Yeah. Uh, so have you done other, have you done things besides games? Have you written about films and music um, I haven't published much of it. I like to write about anime. Okay. Um, Cuz again, it's related a lot in this field. Um, it was something I was really into high school and then when I was in high school and college, it sort of dropped away from for a while and sort of got back into it, especially with older stuff. Um, but it's 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 all it all feeds in together, especially with Japanese developed stuff. Uh, Cuz when I was getting back into it, I was watching like um, you know, Robotech was kind of one of the big um anime shows that was imported here back in the 80s Love and that. that was that was a part of a part of that was taken from a show called macross that i was watching and then it, it's good because i was writing a book about pc engine games at the time and there's a a lot of licensed games based off of there and it it just helps being familiar with the property like oh okay i know why why this macross is important or know about rama one half and etc cetera, etc cetera. um there's a lot of artists that they also worked like Akira Toriyama again, being familiar with Dr. Slump and Dragon Ball. You're like, Oh, okay. This is why Dragon Quest was so popular. So you've obviously done a lot of writing. Oh yeah. Have you done lots of videos too? Or what do you think about the, Oh, I mean, I just never very... content. Is it, a... it takes a lot of work. I mean, I did some for a little while, just like taking the articles um, on the site and just sort of doing voiceover with footage. Yeah. Uh, and even like that was very simply produced and it still took a lot of work. Um, I don't know if I'm necessarily the best presenter. I'm bad at reading scripts. I would just take forever just to do a voiceover and stuff like that. And there's just so much retro video game content out there that trying to make yourself stand apart like I have enough of an audience that I could tell them like this is this is the videos that I do, but just hearing people talk about like the cruelty of the algorithm about what it'll decide to show into people's feeds and like I don't I don't know if I want to deal with any of that stuff. Yeah, it's it's really I mean, that's such a good point. You know, I always enjoyed writing. Yeah, it's my favorite thing to do. But you know, I've obviously been doing a lot of YouTube videos. Like I got interested in talking to uh, doing interviews with game developers and. I remember they'd always want to talk on the phone <laughs> that of write, you know, send emails back and forth. And yeah, and I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, you know, maybe I could put the call online because people probably like to hear their voice. <laughs> you know, it's you know, not morphed than doing these videos. Your, your show came up recently 
when I was reading about this one game called uh, Majoko Daisakusen, which was made by the um, Toys for Bob. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that there's this is a weird story because they were like, um, they wanted to get in contact with Bandai to do like a Gundam game, and they instead somehow found themselves making this really weird strategy game featuring all these magical girl characters from the seventies. And they like they had no idea who these characters were. The communication was just very, very bad. It's a very funny story. Yeah, I talked. I got to talk to those guys. They were just starting their Skylanders. Oh wow, that was a while ago, then, wasn't it? It was just. I think they were in sort of the final phases of that. And, you know, yeah, that's fun. Fun to think back. You know, I caught them right before they really got rich and famous. I mean, I guess they were already famous, but. <laughs> yeah well i mean they're like you know nerd famous they're like oh you're the guys that made star control too let me buy you a beer yeah they're back to doing star control now oh yeah i'm looking forward to that one too pretty fun stuff well, let's see we've talked about final fantasy that was uh yeah i'd read you had talked to this little interview i was reading with about you and you were talking about how you played dragon warrior in final fantasy but that was really final fantasy was I guess the one you preferred. Yeah. <laughs> Out of those. I mean, Final Fantasy VII, of course, everybody knows how big big that game was. Yeah. I don't know what. Can you put your finger on what what's that series so popular pretty much everywhere in the world, I guess? Uh, I mean, it's 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 cool. <laughs> it's hard to find somebody that doesn't like it, you know, at least Yeah. Um it has very interesting characters, a very interesting storylines. Like the they, they have a very distinct iconic look for them. Like a lot of video game series, they were known just for having like consistently excellent soundtracks. Um because they change every entry, it ended up it's a, it's like a plus and a minus because each game is like mostly unrelated to each other. Um is that it sometimes doesn't necessarily feel like each builds off of each other, but at the same time they make them very very distinct um in a way that attracts different fans because everybody has like there's no real consensus about what the best final fantasy game and like you have some vague vibes about well final fantasy 6 and 7 is probably agreed to be one of the better ones but when you get into it like everybody loves their own thing which I, everybody argues about it all the time too but i, I think that sort <laughs> of has been fought <laughs> yeah that, that sort of passion also helps keep the fan base alive um I did. I, I even like the first one. I played that not too. It's probably been a couple of decades ago, but it was enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, I I got that game again at the right time. I was probably like ten years old, and I subscribed to Nintendo Power, and they sent out these little strategy guides. So I studied that guide back and forth before I even got the game, and so I was very well prepared once I actually did get it. Um, but since I and when the sixteen bit era came around, I got a Genesis because I love Sonic the Hedgehog. So I only got to play the Final Fantasy games that. Um, you play a lot of Fantasy Star. Oh yeah, Fantasy Star Two. I got pretty early on, even though I didn't. I got stuck at a certain point. <laughs> um, I never was able to beat it. Um, but I didn't get to play the Super Nintendo games until like later when I was in high school. And like you could get them pretty cheap because they were like video stores were clearancing out the games. You can get a cheap console at Funko Land. <laughs> but then that got me back into Final Fantasy, and I was like, okay, the day Final Fantasy VII came out, I got my PlayStation. Um, but re recently, yeah. on on one of the forums that I, I visit, uh, Reset Era, there was a thread about uh, is Final Fantasy for old people, and it, it sort of got me thinking: is like Final Fantasy, like it used to be is the... Final Fantasy for old people. Yeah, <laughs> um, it used to be the big RPG series, but like. It hasn't really had the same stature because <laughs> again like every one of them all has the same um well they don't there's no, no agreement like i said before but ever since final fantasy 13 there hasn't been quite as uh good a reception and final fantasy 13 at this point is like 15 years old so Final Fantasy 16 came out. I think it I got I got a cool reception, I think. Like people liked it at first, but it's one of those games that the more you play it, the more it just tends to peter out. And right now I'm playing Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth and I I love that. I think they did a fantastic job on that. Um and I think the um the the audience like player base really likes it too. Uh 
but at least in Japan, it hasn't sold the way that they wanted it to. So it sort of makes me feel like if, if like the younger kids really think of the same way as Final Fantasy that someone like me does who've been playing it since they were a kid. Yeah, I guess it's maybe a victim of its own success to some extent. And they're like, oh, yeah. everybody heard about this game. I mean, come on, there's all these more. <laughs> yeah, I, all these there's, other games, you know, there's because stuff. there's so many of them, like people don't know where to start. And again, you ask somebody what their favorite Final Fantasy game is, and you'll get 14, 15 different answers, depending on who you ask. Um, you do have to stress that they're not really related to each other. And you can, like, if you like old games, you can, like, play the original Nintendo ones, but otherwise, you could probably skip them. Um, the 16 bit ones sold up really well. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of things like that that have been around forever. Like, like Gundam is one of those anime series that's been around since the late 70s. Where do you start with it? <laughs> ask, ask a Gundam fan, you'll get, get impossible number of answers. What do you tell people if they're like, oh, I'm kind of curious about JRPGs? Uh, what would you recommend as, as, as the game to the first one I should play? I mean, ah, what's a good intro? There is, oh, nowadays. I mean, I really like the Yakuza games. They sort of tended out to like a dragon. Um, like, it's a series that's been around for a long time, but they were very, like, action y. And in the more recent ones, they adopted, like, a turn based battle system. So now it's like a, a, a proper RPG. Uh, and they, they have the very real world, it, like, it takes place in real world Japan and, and Hawaii. Um, it, it, it walks this tough line between like really serious Yakuza drama and just really goofy video gaming nonsense. Um, it, it, it walks that bounty in a way that I haven't really uh, hmm. thought like, like a lot of games are like that. Like I like stuff that takes itself greedily seriously, but also is very silly. Um, oh, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a like, I remember talking to one of my friends from college and I was really surprised that she was into Elden Ring because she isn't somebody who like normally plays like a lot of video games. When you think of Elden Ring, that's like a From Software game. Uh, that's like for the people who really get into like systems and punishment and stuff like that. But you know, she really dug it. Hmm. Um, my wife really loves Persona Five. Like she played through that game like twice. That's a good, I think, starting point because they're they're super stylish. They're easy to understand. They have cool storylines and just it's a really cool presentation. Um, I'm always hesitant because those games, even the Yakuza games, they can be real time sinks. Like it, it take like a hundred hours to get through Persona Five. Um, well, depending on hundred good hours, or is yeah, it... I mean, yeah, there's some pacing issues <laughs> with stuff like Persona. That's why like I sort of burn out on them after a while. And you know, when I was like in school, you can justify that but as an adult it's a little hard to find the time um not exactly a resume builder yeah <laughs> but yeah I, I've, i hear people talk about this you know this that game is so addictive you should you should stay away from it but i'm always thinking well if it's addictive it must also be fun <laughs> you know? most of the time but sometimes like you, you fall into a game and then you're like i wasted an entire day playing this and i don't feel anything oh uh, those, are, those are the bad ones but you know, do you find more people asking you about retro games versus modern stuff? I mean, is there? Yeah, because I'm mostly I like a lot more interest. Just my, from my point of view, it feels like there's this huge interest now in retro stuff. Yeah, that's good because sometimes I I get I don't know what it's like for you. What what is it? I get a little self aware. Like, oh no, what if all this this writing I've done over my entire life is just going to be forgotten because people are just going to start caring about Fortnite and Roblox and everybody's going to forget. <laughs> so I have, I have those existential crises every now and again. Um, I think though that people are generally curious about this stuff, which is good because it's it's continued to stay for keep alive for so long and i hope it continues to stay alive yeah especially with a site like yours because everybody's got that that game they fell in love with and still play and then they, they find out that oh look there's other people that you know are yeah. writing about this i mean it's such a treat uh let's see so we talked a little bit about the graphic adventures i wanted to show the uh the book i think it's uh 
Well, here we go. So, yeah, here's the Amazon page. Yeah. So there's lots of them. I'm going to try. Yeah, here it is. Yep. Now, this is the one I have. Yeah, that was the very first one I did. So this came out in 2011. So how'd this book do? Uh, pretty well. It continues to sell like pretty well. Because I don't think there's a, really a whole lot like it. Um, the closest one is, again, Bitmap did a book about uh, graphic adventure <laughs> oh, games. Just notice it, that that chicken then with the pulley. Yeah, yeah. I still have the, the chicken somewhere. Yeah, the Max is in my... Uh, Day of the Tentacle? Daughter's um, like plushy. Yeah, there's, that's actually a cross stitch. I don't know if you could tell that I had it. I, don't know, I just thought it was really funny that someone like an old woman would have... A cross stitch of purple tentacle in there. <laughs> Why not? Oh, well, yeah. That's a good cover. Yeah. And um well, one of my friends is a an art teacher and she she took this photograph and designed a lot of that stuff. She made that Max plushie, that little um medallion over there that's from Gabriel Knight. Oh unfortunately broke in a move, so I had to throw it out. Oh, that's a shame. Now, yeah, I the Gabriel uh not Gabriel Knight, uh uh, the Phantasmagoria too. <laughs> oh yeah! Ever since, <laughs> with with the money I I earned from from this book, I bought more adventure games <laughs> in front of my shop. Oh, these are some great. So this is probably your. Is that your first love or second love? Of... Oh man, I don't even know. Um, it certainly ranks up there. I I've I pretty broad interest in this sort of stuff. Um. Now, when I like when I first got a computer, it was a summer where we went on vacation in Maine and we had gotten a big like series of reference books. And one of them was um, like oh, those adventure game guidebooks that covered all the stuff that was out at the time. And I again, I studied through all of it until I could finally get back home and start playing one of these games. And I sort of thought, well, what if there was a book that was like this? But instead of being strategy guides, it was about reviews. Uh, so that's how that, that sort of came together. Yeah, this one thing I always loved about that genre is you can finish it. <laughs> <laughs> the games that got start in the middle and then you feel this sense of oh, yeah. Except Codename Iceman. I don't think I ever I, I must have beat I remember beating that game, but it was way after the fact. Like that game because it was mostly like a submarine simulator, but it was a submarine simulator made by an absolute bastard. So I never got anywhere. <laughs> yeah, a lot of those games are so many spots where I don't know what you would People claim that they've gotten through them without any hints or walkthroughs. Yeah. I'm always like, really? <laughs> I mean, have uh -huh. you ever you ever gotten stuck in an adventure game? And like, how long do you give yourself before you say, "Okay, I'm going to look for some hints"? Oh, uh, I mean, nowadays I'll be like, ah, five minutes, and then I'm off to Google. Um, but we, uh, our site's podcast, we are going to talk about Leisure Suit Larry Seven tomorrow, <laughs> and it, it's just fun to futz around and see what you can figure out but other things are just like i would have never thought of that and that's one of the better design games too <laughs> yeah so i was just thinking of some of those gabriel knight puzzles and... oh that was i mean even back then i had i had the guidebook like right next next to me because oh the the stuff with the, the the drum i think we needed to make the drum signals like you needed to make like a very specific carving messages and like i don't know how anybody would have think of thought that one the one that always stands out to me is the thing with the cat and the mustache and all oh that that famous one from the third game yeah the person doesn't even have a mustache yeah. <laughs> there's something like that but I still it's just something about that genre and I always uh, wondered why it was like so popular there for a while and you got the Infocom and then the Sierra and the the, the Lucas stuff yeah. Petered out, and everybody's like, "Oh, this is a dead genre." You notice it kind of, I feel like it's coming back to some extent now. Yeah, I mean, after that book came out, that was Big when um, there's a lot of like the Monkey Island stuff is kind of fresh again. Yeah, um, after the book came out, that was when uh, Double Fine did their Double Fine Adventure Kickstarter, and that only not started like the beginning of the crowdfunding, but also adventure games like really coming back. It was one of the first really successful ones too, right? Yeah, it was. They, they it did really well. Um, and then I, I never played it completely. <laughs> completely, I don't know the reception of that game when it came out seemed kind of cool. Like not like a little, like wasn't quite what people wanted it to be. But some of the other ones that have come out more recently, like I like the new Monkey Island game. Um, 
but like a lot of things that sort of evolves into other cinematic games, like the Telltale games were really popular for a while. Um, yeah. Life is Strange was another good one. I mean, all these would come out because I like those Walking Dead games they did. I, I was, I'm not big into zombie stuff, so I never played very much of that one. No, um, the Sam and Max ones are pretty good. Too. The Sam and Max ones are really good. No, um, but I mean, people have always wanted like interactive stories and like, OK, how do you make the story interactive? Well, they just took the framework of these adventure games and that's how it happened. Now, that's, that's the same thing happened going back to RPGs in Japan. They're like, OK, we want to tell a story. How do we put this in a video game medium? Well, here's the mechanics of an RPG. Let's just do that. Have you seen the remake of Colossal Cave that the Williams? Uh... I haven't. I, I'm aware of it, but I haven't like played it at all. Weren't they redoing some stuff of it? Yeah, like kind of the 3D engine, and it's kind of an interesting story because I guess that was the game that they that uh, Roberta fell in love with, and they wanted to, you know, she convinced Ken that they needed to make Mystery House and yeah, all that stuff. So it's kind of like return to their to the roots, I guess, to some extent. Yeah, I don't know if it's really been all that. You know, I don't know if, if they weren't involved in it. I don't know how much attention it would be getting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I people, people I, love them so much, you know, and <laughs> rightfully so. But I'm hoping they'll go on and make some uh, some more games. Yeah, I mean, I know some of the some of the guys are retired, but um, they tried to make uh, at least one of them a new Space Quest game, or not Space, but yeah, Space Adventure. It was not using the license, but yeah, um, all kinds of licensing issues. Uh, it ran into development issues. Like I, I was a backer for it, so I have it somewhere, um, with whatever pre-release versions out. But it just ran into problems. And I think yeah, Lori and Corey Cole did the, uh, the Rogue U or Hero U or something. Yeah, they did Hero U. Um, there was a another Leisure Suit Larry HD version, but that came out I think almost a decade ago. And then some, I want to say German company. They actually bought the license for that, and they've been did. German. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Like uh in, in Germany, Germany loves adventure games. Like there's a fan made Zach McCracken game. Um I want to say there's uh someone officially licenses a couple Simon the Sorcerer games. There's a new Simon the Sorcerer made by somebody. I don't know where it's coming from. This is a long time ago I read about it. A little bit spicy, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that Zach McCracken game too. The that the whole tabloid theme. Yeah. It was just so much fun. I have all that stuff. Like, it's all... I mean, you can't see it because there's off, off the camera. <laughs> but... Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to be making a Laser Suit Larry game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, how could you even do it? Could it even make it to the shelf? And, you know, make uh, it, could it be banned from Steam? <laughs> there actually was uh, some sort of issue where I think when it... Because you can put anything on... It's really all that... You know, X rated or anything. But it just, really isn't there, but like on Steam, I don't think you need an ESARB rating because they don't require that for digital stuff. That style of humor work. <laughs> yeah, I played a little bit of it, and it was, I don't know, it was all like Larry is out of touch with all yeah. these, you know, girls using dating apps, and I don't know about that sort of humor. But people have said it gets better, so I never sat down and played them very much. We'll see. Maybe somebody watching this can, can fill us in. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, they actually, uh, when it came out on the Switch, there was some sort of thing where they had to go back and censor something because it was in violation of ESRB ratings. Uh, I wonder what that could be. Yeah, I don't I don't remember what it was. Interesting. I'm, I'm curious about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you, you know, since you, would you, I guess you're kind of, you've done a lot of computer stuff and console stuff. I've always been more focused on the computer, yeah, the computer side of it. Do you think there's more? Do you think it's the case that the console stuff is still there's a bigger audience there? I think so, just on the basis that more people have played it, um, more people have the nostalgia for it, and therefore they're more likely to be curious about it. Um, I mean, my again, I was big into PC gaming in the '90s, so that's where a lot of my interest in it lies, particularly on adventure games. So. But I also like remember old like strategy games and stuff like that. Like I dug out, I only played the first Heroes of Might and Magic when I was a kid. Um, but of course, there's 
I don't even know how many there are now. I only got up to the third one because people seem to say that that's the best one. I think it is. I went back and played it fairly recently, and yeah, it's still it's still a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm trying to dig into memories about like Master of Orion and the sort of four X games that I played back then. You ever played um, XCOM? I, oh, he did. I got my ass kicked <laughs> by XCOM. One of my friends was able to beat that game, and I still don't know how he was able to do it. Like, I I was never able to make any actual progress. Like, I think you get to the point where, like, okay, you started capturing aliens, and then you marginally got better tech, and then they would just come out with even better tech and just kill everybody. <laughs> but I, I had fun playing that anyway. Then it's the old ones. I really like the newer ones. I played um, at least a new one of those. The first one, the one that came out on the Xbox 360. Uh, and the other ones I have, but I just never sat down with them. Not out of disinterest, but just because. Something about those. They just suck me in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's certain genres or whatever, I guess, that just grab some people. No. Oh. Like your friend with the. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to do. I'm, I'm sort of working on a side project that's focusing on, on 90s PC games. Um, Say more. So I'm hoping that there would be an interest in that sort of stuff, like beyond. Because they have um, Bitmap already has. They have a book on CRPGs. They have a series of books on first person shooters. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm all anybody seems to want to talk about but you know there's tons of other stuff there is a, a whole ton of other stuff um i'm just kind of going through and formulate exactly what was in this like there's so many bazillion of like strategy games um that seem to be kind of forgotten like you can still get them on gog and stuff like that but i don't know if people really talk about them like i i, I still have some of like the old pc gamer magazines and there's a lot of stuff that just like forgotten and nobody cares about. Like there's bazillion flight simulators. There was a bazillion war games that came out around that time. Like I don't like uh, the 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 flight sims sold themselves on being very technically advanced, and obviously it's not in the case like thirty years later. I think you'd probably just play flight simulator if you wanted something like that. I always like Red Baron. Yeah, I mean like Tie Fighter. Um, yeah. Fighters, tie fighter was the big one and, you know wing commander uh i think it's, those are the the easy to understand talking about like the microsoft flight simulator the real yeah like uh <laughs> jeans there was somebody i'm part of one of those facebook pages that has like old um big boxes and stuff like that and there's somebody that had this whole big shelf of those jeans fight simulators i had no idea they were even that many of them and like i i'm not really big into that sort of stuff i just remember playing a demo of one of them a long time ago but yeah that's it's just weird how this stuff gets forgotten um even when like the the adventure game book there's a lot of it that had to get skipped over um not only just because i was running out of time and space and getting exhausted but um a lot of it fell into this this whole i don't know what to call it, like a windows hole because at the time it was like 2009 2010 it was probably running windows xp or something like that but the Windows 3.1 and 95 and 98 era, there's huge compatibility problems with those. Oh, yeah. And nowadays, if there's an old game, I'll just boot up like a PC emulator and play it through there. And sometimes it doesn't always run very well, but like trying to get some of those games are a little dodgy. Even stuff I buy off of GOG or Steam, they don't always work right. I'm glad I'm not the only one having that problem. You know, yeah, I if it's a DOS game, it's almost guaranteed you're almost guaranteed to be able to get it to work. Oh, DOS games are fine because they just run through DOS box and DOS that has box also many problems. But yeah, that early Windows stuff. You know, even Diablo, I was having a real tough time. This is, I guess, before it's probably fixed now. Yeah, <laughs> but like by the time I got it to run at all, it being like a tiny little window on my screen, and you know, if I tried to capture any video from it, it wouldn't. Capture. Yeah, I and mean, just all sorts of little irritating issues like that some games if they I mean like a windows box <laughs> yeah like pc the pc em is the closest i found to something like that and configuring uh, configuring that is a real pain in the ass and a lot of the problem is because what's it like, called microsoft still claims ownership over those ancient versions of windows what's so, the name of that later pc em pc em okay. yeah should check that out um that's just mostly like yeah, sometimes a, a game, if you get it off a of GOG, it doesn't work. And then you, you go to go to an abandoned site and you can't find the ISO. So 
<laughs> you can track down like an actual disc and then use it on the emulator and then try to get it to work. Man, always there's always something like the mouse doesn't work right. It's super fast, or the yeah. audio. When I was talking with one of my writers about like Civilization, like Civilization Two fell into a black hole. Like it was like hugely popular at the time, but you can't buy it anywhere anymore because it was like a Windows ninety five game, and I guess because of the way the genre works, they assume that all people just play a newer one. If they want to play Civilization, it's so but, wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess I don't know enough about the old, the newer ones, but oh, that no, game was I, important. <laughs> like by three, you know, and I, I said I got a bunch of friends that play Civ, and it seemed like they're all they all have their favorite one, and they won't play any of the <laughs> other ones. <laughs> yeah, I think Civ three is still a big popular game. Yeah, yeah I, like but that's... I don't. I like it. I don't think I've ever played a Civ game I didn't like. The last one I really played was. Like two, two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you got we're kind of been talking for an hour. You got time for a couple more? No, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, well, let me hit you with some of these. Uh, so what do you think about we've kind of been talking about this already, really, but the preservation of all this stuff. You know, we you talked about games falling into black holes, and even though we've got oh, yeah. compilations, you know, there's there's a lot left, and I'm not sure that all the publishers you know, agree that it's important to preserve this stuff, you know, especially if, yeah. there's money, if there's money to be made, that's one thing, but a lot of, some of the games we're talking about here, maybe there's not a huge you know, yeah. line of people, so whose responsibility is it to preserve this stuff? Is, is it uh, I mean, in an ideal world, it should be the companies, because when you think of movies, like, I mean, movies get lost to an extent, too, because there's a bunch of obscure stuff that, like, was only ever released on VHS or Laserdisc, um, and you can't find it streaming or anything like that. So those tend to be um, saved by the fans. But, like, for the most part, there's so much more preservation and being able to, like, make that stuff accessible. Like, I mean, there's still issues with streaming and things like that, but it's still a much better situation than it is with video games where so much of it is lost um and part of it is the yeah like a company needs to care and what wh whether that company cares is a little hit or miss um cuz when i say company i just mean in like the broad sense like like not everybody there is an evil capitalist but you can find like a producer who would be really into that sort of stuff and be like really put their um really put all their effort into making old stuff like that happens but, you know, that depends on the culture and the regime at the time. Like, I think for a long time, LucasArts was very like, we don't do video games, so don't talk to us. And then somebody got fired or left and then the person who replaced them was like, oh, yeah, I love this stuff. So um, hmm. it's unfortunate that, uh, that stuff like that is sort of at the whims of whoever's in charge. But that's the reality of entertainment. Um, it always bothered me that. <sighs> You know, if they're if they're going to go after somebody, some kind of emulation site or abandonware site, mm -hmm. you know, if they've got the wherewithal to say take that down, <laughs> shouldn't they have to offer it themselves? Yeah. I mean, because I think a lot of people they don't want to do the abandon where they'd rather buy it from from you, you know, the company. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's especially not available. It's, what are you going to do? It's it's cheap. It's uh, in theory they're supposed to work. Sometimes they don't always work. Um. But yeah, it's it really is an accessibility issue. Um, and if they don't do it, then. <laughs> but you also run into problems with licenses. Like it's it's been a, it sounds like a, a prof um, like a real hell to try to get uh, no one lives forever, because just like the company went out of business and the rights got torn into all these different directions and all these parties need to agree on all these terms and. Or just somebody needs to find a piece of paperwork somewhere or it just gets really complicated, especially when it gets into licenses. Because one book that I recently uh, put together, but it's not out yet, is about movie games. And there is so many of those games that are just like forgotten, basically, and will never get reissued because uh, working working with the licensors is just a pain in the ass. What do you mean by movie game? Is it? A game based on a movie or? Oh, yeah. All games that right. were based off of like 80s or 90s movies. So it was like every Jurassic Park game, every um, 
I don't know, Terminator game. Beethoven. Every Aliens game. Yeah. Oh, Beethoven. Yeah. There was a couple of those. Bill um, so, and a lot of those, again, are lost till time. Although, um, like, Limited Run Games has been actually pretty good about resurrecting some of them. Like, they actually put out a collection of Jurassic Park games. Okay. Um, it's not comprehensive, but, like, you wouldn't necessarily... It's, that's something that not necessarily a lot of people would try to pursue. Um, I can see why that would be tricky, because some of those movies are... You know, Jurassic Park being a good example. I mean, huge license, you know. And yeah, and it's huge. like so GoldenEye money. was a real big issue for a long time um, because, you know, they made a remake of Perfect Dark Rare for the Xbox 360, and then they were going to do one for GoldenEye. They had everything basically completed, and then, like, some somebody didn't give their signature somewhere, you know, for likeness or who knows whatever reason, and the whole thing just fell apart. Um. This happens a lot in Japan, too, especially because, I mean, back in those days, the, the industry was very small. Contracts are a little bit, you know, whatever. So, like, who owns the rights to stuff? Maybe that person is uh, disappeared. Maybe they passed away. Um, there, there's, there's some sort of law recently, and I'm not super sure about how it works, but there's this process that if a company goes through and does all their due diligence to find try to find who owns the property, and if they can't find it, then there's a way to claim ownership about it. And huh. um, I, I'm not sure on the specifics because I've only heard it secondhand, but there's this company who puts out old shoot 'em ups um, called M2, and they own the rights for a company called Toaplan. And they did a whole bunch of you know, ride in like shoot 'em ups during the eighties and nineties. And there was some um like old Nintendo ports that I think was actually developed by an American company. Uh that that they, they went through that process of like, okay, we own the rights to this stuff. We have no idea who actually owns the rights to these other games, but because we did the the legal work, we'll say that we own it. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that works. Yeah. I mean, it would it would be nice if more of that stuff happened. But even in Japan, you find, you know, you hear interviews of producers and stuff like we tried to get the rights to this game, but we just couldn't do it. Um, and, and in that case, it just falls to like regular people to pirate it. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot of uh, developers that worked on the games, too, and they might want to. You know, their fans have been saying we want to remake, we want this and that and. Even they have no idea. Like I don't know who has the rights to this. Yeah, <laughs> it would cost, or, or maybe it's a question of it. It costs so much money to get the license. You know, it'd, it'd be the wouldn't have enough money left over to develop the game. Yeah, <laughs> just the the legwork required. Uh, well, kind of uh, related to that. Uh, I don't know if you've been keeping track in the of the news about all the layoffs in the industry. And, it's you know, bad. Yeah, crisis. You know, let's just and. The whole AI thing, you know, is kind of looming out there, and just seem like there's <laughs> endless controversies. Yeah, <laughs> endless. Uh, I don't even know how to describe some of it. Uh, what? <laughs> I'm kind of curious what your take is. You, do you think it's as bad as all that? And what, <laughs> what? What can people do about it? Is there anything to be done? Oh, I, I I'm completely unqualified to answer <laughs> like that. As <laughs> like you know, I've never actually worked for a video game company. I've worked like tangentially with other stuff and hear things, but not enough to say like, how do you fix this problem? Yeah, maybe um, the solution. You know, it does seem like the fan base is kind of, you know, the way they're responding to things it probably isn't helping. <laughs> uh, I mean, hits come from the weirdest places, like like that that Pal World game, just like it's an explosive hit. Do you think anybody ever anticipated that? Probably mm -hmm. not. Um, like the weirdest games people uh, attach themselves to and it isn't always predictable. Um, so, I mean, you, you see like a big money person like, OK, if we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a game, we want to make sure it's as broad as possible. But then if those games fall out of fashion or they just the, the, the even the break even point is so high that they'll just never reach it. I think Square Enix had that problem for a while with some of its Eidos games. Like, I don't remember the numbers, but games like uh, Deus Ex and Tomb Raider, just like the expectations they had for these games were just 
<laughs> wildly beyond what you think they could actually sell. And maybe that was just, they created those expectations because their budget was too high. <laughs> now, I mean, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot of developers, they talk about, you know, on the one hand, that's great that we've got so many games. And I mean, everybody's got Steam libraries these days with probably 10,000 more games than they'll ever play. Oh, yeah. Out in the world, you get noticed. And, you know, if, if AI is going to start pumping out games. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's going to be like anything AI. Like, they might put it out, but it'll be bad. And, and people can tell that it's bad. I like to think so. All right. Well, I got one last question here from Miko. All right. What do you think about the recent trends of remaking and remastering old games? Uh, it's good because it makes them available again. Um, I do wish sometimes that they would pay attention to the history of the game a little bit more in that it, it's nice to like, you know, add in like widescreen graphics and stuff like that or, or just update the textures and things. Uh, I, I do wish that some place would, would keep an original mode and some places would do like, like night dive. Almost all the stuff they do is like <laughs> chef's right kiss. Now. Like uh, like Dark Forces, they put a lot of work into like making it really look good. But even me, because I'm an old weirdo, like I still put it in like the VGA mode because that's how I remember playing it. <laughs> um, yeah, I do wish stuff like that would happen more. Um, I know it's, they do tend to get a little pricey because that was thirty bucks, which was I think a little bit, especially if you consider like a lot of other first person shooters, you get Gog is like six seven dollars, but they also put a lot of work into it. And it's a licensed game, and there's all that sort of stuff with it. Yeah, I guess they want to make as much profit as they can. can yeah, I do love the ones. Continue making more. <laughs> yeah, I do love the ones that really uh, contextualize things, um, especially the digital eclipse ones. Like I haven't played the the Jeff Minner one yet, but the the Karateka one was really cool. Like I don't even like Karateka. Like it's it's a rough game. I mean, it's, it's very much of its era. Uh, but that whole package was just fascinating. Yeah, we were just talking about Last Express came up in something. Oh, yeah. Since since Jordan Mechner seems to do a lot of that stuff, you know. That was maybe, a labor of love there. I don't know. Have you, <laughs> maybe yeah. we'll, we'll get that. It, it would be cool to see that again. Can you get that on? That's probably on GOG, right? On one of those? Last Express? I've never been able to. Oh, no, I don't I stand corrected. Yeah. Well, let me see. Is it on GOG you're wanting to know? No. I mean, when I played it, I probably just yeah, it is on. Well, let me just sometimes sometimes you find it, you think you found it. No, it's here. Yeah, six dollars. Yeah, like when I was doing the the adventure game book was before it was right as Gog was first getting started. It was right as Steam was. I mean, Steam had been around for a while, but it was um just starting to pick up Steam. <laughs> this game, um, the artist style on this always just blew my mind. Yeah, it was really cool. So sort of got its own style. But I was actually buying CDs off of eBay back then. I still have a ton of them on the shelves or in my attic. <laughs> yeah. You have to make sure you get a computer with, that still has the CD for DVD-ROM on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I bought, like, when I went to go buy my new computer a couple of years ago, I was like, what do you mean they don't have CD-ROM drives on computers anymore? <laughs> they, they I look at me like I'm an old person. Like, you would you like a floppy drive with that? Like, yeah, actually, I would. Yeah, I really wish instead of, I would always sell my old computer to buy the new, you know, by the new computer. I really wish now I'd kept all of them because there's certain yeah. games, I'm sure <laughs> the easiest thing to do would be just to play it on the old machine. <laughs> I was asking one of my friends, I got a, a at a garage sale, like a Windows XP computer, and I was like, could you run like MS-DOS or early Windows on those? Like, is there anything from a technical perspective that was stopping you? Like, if I wanted to turn it into like a retro rig. Probably not the right person to ask. Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of wondering out, out loud is stuffing like that. I don't see why you, you couldn't. Yeah. I mean, I do remember there was a short period of time. Those are like, uh, maybe it would have something to do with the processor. Yeah, I mean, as long as they're still 32-bit, I think it should be okay. But yeah, there, there's a period of time where um, it was right after Windows like became a proper operating system. Because, you know, the earlier versions of Windows were basically just fancy GUIs for DOS. And it was either 95 or 98 that was like, okay, we're, in a, we're a real operating system now. But that ended up causing problems for certain DOS games. Because I remember in, in college around 2000, 2001, I was like, I really want to play Star Control 2 again. 
and it just wouldn't work on modern hardware, even if you exited into DOS. So I actually, I bought a 3DO off of eBay and, and got a copy of the 3DO version of the game and played it that way. Um, Was it a good, good experience? oh, yeah. I mean, I'd always wanted to play that because like I had a friend of a friend that had a 3DO and Star Control 2 and that version, they added a lot of stuff to it. It's like fully voiced dialogue. They redid some of the music. They did some of the graphics. So that was really cool. And then, of course, they, they wrapped that version back into like the Urquan Masters that you can get for free. So but, like I was able you can play on your cell phone. Nothing spathy. Yeah. Well, man, we used to have a ball with that game. <laughs> have a bunch of friends over, just play Star Control. Combat. I would bring it to the college game nights. And of course, like nobody knew what Star Control was, but, you know, they'd get into the, you know, the melee, super melee battles and just have a blast. Yeah, it's fun. Fun stuff. I still use some of those little musical ditties. You know, when you beat, <laughs> when yeah. you beat a little tune. <laughs> I always love those. Well, hey, Kurt, thanks for taking the time to chat with me, man. Oh, of course. You said you got a new book or your movie book might. What's the status on that? It's coming out soon or? I actually have no idea. <laughs> I need to follow up with the, the publisher because a lot of the stuff I, I self publish that. that's my collection. Yeah. When when it's it's done, I just hit the button and it's it's out. Um but with a publisher, it just it, it takes time because they have to check it, they have to print it and all that sort of stuff. Is that gonna be bitmap books as well? Oh uh, no, it's actually gonna uh, be published by Press Run. Okay. Um they're they're a, a part of limited run games that uh they started publishing books recently i'm really looking forward to getting my copy of a guide to japanese role playing yep. <laughs> so, okay well thanks again uh Kurt. it's been fun hope have, hopefully uh when that book comes out maybe I can have you back on i hope and talk <laughs> about book games. oh of course yeah <laughs> all right well have a good one thanks again all right good chatting with you And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, man, what a what a cool dude. It's always fun to get to meet people like Kurt. Uh, fellow writers, you know, it's kind of a, sometimes I feel like there's parallel versions of myself out there, you know. Like, what if I'd uh, really gotten into console gaming instead of uh, the computer side? And, you know, what if I'd have gone to Japan and all these other things? And what if I'd have just stuck with writing? You know, not done the YouTube channel. You know, who knows? It's fun uh, to think about those things, those what-if scenarios, right? Well, uh, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, uh, we wouldn't have this channel, <laughs> with, you know, Matt Chat, uh, without people like you. Because I guess at some point you thought, what if we didn't have Matt Chat? No, I don't even want to think about that. I want to go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page, and I wanted to become a retron. The real deal. I want to slay rats with Matt. <laughs> uh, so, uh, if you want to be as cool as people like the Fixed Land and Will, <laughs> you will uh, join us over on Discord and on the Patreon site. You know, a lot of people think, uh, they don't realize, I guess, that it's, uh, maybe you're thinking it's like an inconvenient thing, it'll be expensive or something like that. Uh, it's really nothing to it. It's just a couple of clicks on a mouse and a couple of bucks a month. You're not even going to miss it. Uh, and you'll be supporting the show and you'll earn my uh, gratitude and thanks, my uh, eternal and sincere thanks for keeping uh, me and this show going for so long. So uh, thank you to everyone who has supported the show. And if you haven't done so yet, please do. I could really, really use your help, uh, especially now. Uh, okay, well, did I forget something? <laughs> uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, uh, let's see. First up, Tired Gaming Dad. Yes, he's uh, got a lot of young games <laughs> he's very proud of. I'll show you a picture of all his grand games. Uh, anyway, uh, he's... Remember that uh, retro, or I'm sorry, EXO, ExoDOS, uh, when I did the interview there? Well, that package is now available on Etsy in a physical form. Uh, so if you want to uh, show some support to the uh, developers there, uh, they got five different editions, and these are all really cool, nifty, collectible type uh, packages, nice boxes, high quality 
uh, pack-ins, all sorts of collectibles, there's a coin. Uh, they range from $15 all the way up to a whopping $265. <laughs> but you, you know, that's uh, the mother of all editions right there, so you should really check it out. Now, let's see, you get, yeah, these boxes are hand numbered and, and some are signed. You get a manual catalog. <laughs> yes, a catalog. It's, there's a lot of humorous stuff uh, in these editions. But uh, anyway, I know a lot of folks are interested in that or using it already. So, you know, maybe pony up uh, 15 bucks and get yourself a copy. Or even the <laughs> $265 version. <laughs> uh, all right, next up, Snap Snapper. Uh, remember uh, Scald against the Black Priory? I've been. Uh, had lots of uh, chats with the uh, developers of that uh, of that game. Well, the uh, release date is May 30th, 2024. So that'll be just in time for summer. <laughs> really looking forward to this. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I really want to mention this because you have to see the trailer. Uh, the release trailer for this thing is just unbelievable. I mean, just trust me. Stop watch your stop this video. Go watch that, that trailer. <laughs> you definitely don't don't want to miss it. It's it's just a real uh, it's a real hoot. Uh, and while you're over there, of course, you can wish list the game on Steam. All right, and then Miko. Uh, I'm going to try my best with this. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> and I'm not a businessman. Uh, I certainly don't run a major studio. Uh, but I'll try my best to try to uh, parse what's happening here. So there's a couple of items. Uh, one is there's a guy named Russ Scott, a.k.a. Accursed Farms, Accursed Farms, and he's got some videos, some efforts, uh, I guess an initiative out uh, called StopKillingGames.com. And what Russ is concerned about are these games that you buy uh, and you don't really own it, per se, legally, whatever, with the EULA. Uh, instead, a company runs the, the servers for the game, uh, and then what happens sometimes is when that uh, ceases to be profitable, uh, the publisher stops supporting the game and suddenly you can't play it. <laughs> so, you know, it literally kills the game off and they don't, uh, they're not, there's no, uh, I guess, uh, uh, procedures in place to migrate those servers to some kind of free service or fan-provided uh, service, so... Uh, it is a problem, you know, when you buy a game uh, thinking that you own it and thinking that you'll be able to play it whenever you like, uh, just to find one day uh, that, oh, <laughs> this game no longer supported, you know, no refund, uh, just sorry, <laughs> that's that sort of thing. Uh, uh, so anyway, you can go to StopKillingGames.com to learn more about this. Uh, and then Miko had uh, you know, posited this other story uh, about Blizzard. Uh, so Blizzard has a new EULA, <laughs> just EULA. <laughs> I remember when games didn't have this crap. You know, I don't know what we've gained uh, from this whole EULA business. You know, like click to accept and blah blah blah. User blah. Just always hated it. <laughs> I guess I'm <laughs> again clearly not a lawyer. I guess it serves some useful purpose, but uh, I just find it anno annoying. I always feel like they're trying to get one over on me somehow with all that fine print. As it appears here, so apparently in the fine print of this, uh, Blizzard EULA, it says you only license and rent all the Blizzard content and you have to go through something called arbitration with every legal claim. Uh, so Miko was thinking maybe this has something to do with Russ. You know, in Russ's effort, maybe they've caught wind of that trying to uh, have some kind of reaction. Uh, I don't know, but hopefully some of you out there know more about this and can... <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, put it in terms I can understand, because I'd like to learn more about what's going on and what can be done, if anything, to uh, stop this. All right, well, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, we've got uh, my last, uh, at least the last I've been able to find of these Athletic Brewing Company flavors. Uh, this one's called Upside Dawn Golden. Uh, so I as you probably know by now, I'm a huge fan of this athletic brewing company. You know, they're doing some, in my opinion, probably the best uh, non-alcoholic brews around, at least ones that you can find fairly readily. Uh, really, I've liked all the ones I've tried so far, so I've got high hopes for this one as well. You know, I really like their shirt to take on uh, Blue Moon. Uh, that was super good. And uh, let's see what else they say. Eh. Water, malted barley. You know, they ought to have a little more right up than this. <laughs> oh, here's a little something. I think they put this on all the bottles. 
or cans rather. Uh, anyway, not a lot to read there, so let's just go ahead and get this open and, and see what it's all about. The Golden Dawn, Upside Dawn. You know, one thing I would like is to have a, to see, to get their take on a, a porter or a stout. And you know, my friend Matt Workle has been saying, I've got to try Guinness Zero. I've yet, I've been, <laughs> he's raving about it. <laughs> I definitely will try it because I do like uh, regular Guinness. I've not yet tried their non-alcoholic variety. So you can see this, uh, this gold in here. It's a little bit light colored. You know, I would expect it to be a little darker since they call it golden. <laughs> More of a kind of a pale uh, color, but that's all right. I think I'll pour the rest here in ye old drinking horn. The upside dawn, golden. All right, let's give it a swig. Let's give it a smell first. Eh, eh, fairly hoppy. You know, this isn't supposed to be an IPA, so I'd be surprised if it was super hoppy. You know, that'd be kind of <laughs> mislabeling, but. Now you could smell some hops in this. You could smell the malts uh, as well. I know some of you uh, folks are telling me yeah, you hate anything hoppy. Uh, so this I would say is about half as hoppy as the uh, uh, the other one I had, or their IPA, which is you know pretty much what I would expect. Wow! Hang on. Once again, <laughs> it's just you can't go wrong with these these athletics. I, I need to have these guys on the show. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how they did this. I'm going to try it again here. Yeah, just really, really good. Um, you know, again, it's not an IPA. It's, a, it's supposed to be a golden. Uh, so kind of a moderate uh, flavor profile on this. Again, not hoppy, not bitter. Uh, I don't really know. I don't drink a whole lot of beers in this style. So I don't have a whole lot of stuff to compare it to. But you know, it's definitely good. Uh, and once again... I'm convinced if I didn't tell you up front this was non-alcoholic and just poured you this beer and said try it, uh, I don't think you would know. I'm going to try the, from the glass. It's just amazing to me. It just tastes like a, you know, good quality, uh, a good quality beer here. You know, again, not my favorite style of beer. You know, I tend to like an IPA or uh, I really like those... Um, you know, the white L's of the Belgian styles, uh, but you know, just every now and then you just kind of want a regular beer without a whole lot of uh, <laughs> exotic flavors or anything. Uh, so I think this would fit the bill. You know, sometimes I think about you've been mowing the grass. It's a hot summer day. You come home. You want to, or you come inside. You want a nice cold one. Well, here you go. And this one won't cause you any problems. Mm. Yeah, just really, really good stuff. I think you would like that. Uh, again, especially you guys that don't like the hoppy stuff, you know, give this one a go. I think you'll be uh, satisfied. What do I do with the can? <laughs> so, upside down, uh, upside uh, dawn golden. Uh, once again, I'll try to do two ratings. Uh, so, just in terms of non-alcoholics, high, high up there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know a whole lot about this style, <laughs> you know, as I said, but you know, I would say if you if I would probably go somewhere between a four and a five uh, drinking horns on this. Again, especially if you are not a big fan of real hoppy beers or real citrusy beers. Uh, you want something a little bit more medium, you know, I think you'd probably want to go. You'd probably give that a five. <laughs> now, just in terms, of course, of all beer, you know, I don't know if it makes a whole lot of sense to try to uh, compare these. You know, I guess out of if I was just rating it just <laughs> with all other beers I've tried, I'd probably go like a uh, probably a three, uh, three out of five on this. I wish you know some of you other guys that are uh, trying these do chime in. You know, especially like to hear from people that uh, again don't like those other styles as much. You know, I'd like to get your take on that. Uh, but anyway, I like it. I don't think you'd be disappointed with it. So definitely pick it up if you get a chance. You know, I'm kind of surprised that um, uh, more restaurants aren't offering non-alcoholic brews. You know, I just think it's it's like a, a match made in heaven, right? I don't. Do you have to have a liquor license for these? 
I mean, I can buy these just at a regular stores. You know, it's not like in a special you know, alcohol section or anything. It's just, you know, there with like Cokes and Dr. Peppers, and then there's these uh, athletic uh, brews. So I would, I think a restaurant's, uh, if I was running a restaurant, I would get some of these uh, just so people uh, have an alternative to Cokes and Pepsis or whatever. Uh, and they don't have to worry about people getting drunk <laughs> because of the scene in the restaurant, right? Seems like a win-win to me. Uh, but anyway, maybe I'll see if there's some stock. <laughs> can you invest in... Uh, how can I invest in an athletic uh, brewing company? I'd love to do that. Uh, okay, uh, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotes uh, from Japan, uh, from Japanese authors. Uh, and there's, a, of course, tons. <laughs> uh, but I found one I thought was really cool. And I've been wanting to read this book for a while. I haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, the author is Miyamoto uh, Miyamoto Mishashi, I believe, in a book about, uh, I think it's called The Book of Five Rings. Uh, so this uh, author was a, they call a sword saint. <laughs> so uh, apparently knows a lot about sword play as well as philosophy and poetry. Just sounds like a really interesting person. Anyway, the quotation uh, goes something like this. Under the sword lifted high. There is hell making you tremble, but go straight ahead, and there is the land of bliss. Pretty deep. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why I fully understand this, but I will ponder on that, and I hope you will too, and I'll see you next time. You can put combinations together without even thinking. I do learn how to keep moving and to endure. Hire a bodyguard or lead a less aggressive life.